ministering in a church in Karlsruhe, Germany. Was it last year or the previous year? And um, they do live streaming and they also broadcast um, on national television. And just before I came forward to share the word, they would typically pray over prayer requests and they would have a pile of prayer requests, you know, people listening in on the internet and on the television. And the elders would come and they'd lay their hands on these requests. And, and as I began to share, you know, I said to them, imagine we could, for this moment, have all the needs of this whole world, just for this moment, not tomorrow's needs, yesterday's needs, right now, represented here. Do we have a gospel that can address the condition that mankind finds themselves in? And until we as the church, the body of Christ, discover a gospel of greater dimensions, a gospel of greater significance than what we have seen evidenced in our societies as a result of Adam's fall. You see, when Paul speaks to us in Romans chapter 5, he says, much more than the effect of one man's transgression. Have you noticed the words much more? Out of all proportion. So Paul sees something that happened to humanity in Christ that by far exceeds everything that happened to the same humanity in Adam. So we have access to a gospel that connects us with the belief of God, with the persuasion of God. So when Paul announces the gospel, I'm just giving a bit of um, feedback on last night's introduction. In Romans chapter 116, when Paul announces with bold confidence, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God. You see, he's talking about a different resource than just mind power or muscle power. This is the creator of the universe, the architect of the ages who has come to the rescue of the human race. He says, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes. And just before we get stuck on the who believes bit, he helps us in the next verse <laughs> to give us a very clear reference to where faith comes from, whose faith we are talking about. Because so often we fall into the popular trap of Western theology, where it's all about having to try and do something to get your faith there. You know, God's prepared to come down halfway, but then you've got to do the other half with your faith and try and, he'll, you know, you'll meet halfway. No, no, no. We are talking about the very faith of God. He is the author and finisher of faith. So he says, in this gospel, verse 17, Romans 1, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And then he quotes what Habakkuk said. And maybe I must read this in the, in the Mirror Bible for you. You'll enjoy it in the Mirror Bible. <laughs> can I run around? I don't have a video camera somewhere. Hey, so I can just sometimes I run out of the screen and I've got to go run back again. <clears throat> We're just in Romans chapter 1. And in verse 17, I'll read it from the mirror. Herein lies the secret of the power of the gospel. There is no good news in it until the righteousness of God is revealed. The dynamic of the gospel is the revelation of God's faith as the only valid basis for our belief. The prophets wrote in advance about the fact that God believes that righteousness reveals the life of our design. And he's quoting Habakkuk 2 verse 4. Righteousness by his faith defines life. I haven't done Habakkuk in the mirror yet, so you can go and read in any, even King James would tell you, righteousness by his faith. The just shall live by his faith. Righteousness by his faith defines life. 
You see, God is absolutely persuaded about the life of your design. I remember years ago, <clears throat> Lydia and I live in Hermanus, 80 miles south of Cape Town, very close to the southernmost tip of Africa. And Hermanus is known for its land-based whale watching. For six months of the year, from about June, July, until into the first few weeks of December, we have the southern right whales coming all the way from the Antarctic. Is that right? All the way to our coastline. And they come once a year to mate, and the next year to give birth. And um, when Lydia and I began in Hermanus, when was that? About 18 years ago. We were in the tourism industry at that time. We, we were in ministry 14 years, then 14 years out of ministry. This was during the time that we were out of ministry. We were just doing business and tourism. And we had a lodge in the Sabi Sand Game Reserve, and then the whales spat us out in Hermanus. And we started whale watching cruises. And um, uh, a long, sad story. I mentioned a glimpse of it in the first chapter of our book, God Believes in You. But um, I had the joy to take people out by boat and go and show them the whales. Now, our southern right whales are massive. They weigh about 40 tons. And to compare that to your biggest African elephant, the biggest African elephant weighs about seven, maybe eight tons. So you've got these 40-ton creatures, and they're very people-friendly. They kind of connect with you. So I started off, you know, we, we were rock bottom. We, we, we had a tremendous disaster in our business. We lost everything, and so we started with nothing. So my wife, four children, and I, we just, we're there in Hermanus, and um, everyone thinks if you live in Hermanus, you must be a multimillionaire, you're retired. And uh, So I thank God that we got washed out in Hermanus. You know, it's just one of the most beautiful spots on the planet. Uh, I was ministering somewhere in South Africa, and the, and the reverend introduced us. He says, well, Francois and Lydia live in that place, you know, where Jesus spoke of when he says they've had their reward. Uh, so even in South Africa, Hermanus, any, anyway, so that's enough advertising for Hermanus. You can go and Google the rest. So I had a very small little boat. I started off with a four-meter, which is about a 12-foot boat, with a 25 Yamaha outboard motor. And I'm going out to sea. So I would sell my four tickets without showing the people the size of the boat. I'll just tell them, listen, we're going to go out watch you. Would you like to see the whales? If we don't see a whale, you can have your money back. So I'll do it like for, f what, f $10, $15, $12 about, you know. Take them out to two, three hours, and they get to the boat. They say, we're going to go in, <laughs> in this little bathtub, you know. <laughs> and we go out for about three hours. <clears throat> anyway, the one particular day, um, I only had one client. And when I saw the size of his cameras and his bags, I was very happy that it was just the one client. It was not your average tourist. And um, so we went out for about three hours. And um, I asked him about his, um, his cameras, you know. And he said, no, it's his, it's his professional career. And, and then he made the statement. He says, I only need to sell two photographs a year. <laughs> I said, oh, no one ever buys any of my photographs. He sells two a year, and that's his budget done for next year. And I began to just pay attention. I mean, suddenly I realized I'm here in the presence of a master photographer. And it's amazing when you realize, you know, who you're dealing with, how it kind of changes your attention. And I just, I just enjoyed the bliss of witnessing this man's skill. And we had such a time, you know, the whales were performing. And I think they had a hint too that this, you know, they've got to perform. So they're doing all that they could do, that whales do. And then on our way back, two, three hours later, back to the harbor, we had a few hundred cormorants, you know, doing their ballet over the waters. It was just so beautiful, and, and the light was perfect. And he was happily clicking away, and suddenly he screamed, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. I mean, the goosebumps went right down my spine. I said then, woo -ha -ha. And then with shaky hands, he started taking the lenses off and zipping up the bags, and he entered into his rest. Not because he was exhausted, but because he knew with his trained eye that he captured a moment that was worth more than all the equipment in the boat. And Holy Spirit began to minister to me. It took me back to Genesis 1. In fact, it took me back to John chapter 1. Where John goes beyond the genealogies of Abraham and Adam. He says, in the beginning was the word. 
began to imagine how this photographer would document. He would go back to his studio in America and document that moment. It was way before um, digital cameras. And he would go into his dark room and, and he would make so sure that this moment is documented in such a way that no corruption would defile the original moment. You could have it copied in a million magazines, framed in art galleries, but the original is intact. You see, in the beginning was the word. A <laughs> younger son is a classical pianist, and he was honored a few years ago to play in the Gewandhaus in Leipzig. He's eight years already in Europe, and and Lady and I was there, and, and we just sat there as parents and just wept. We were just overwhelmed with the emotion of the moment, reflecting on music that was heard 200 years by the composer Mendelssohn. This was his first piano concerto. And how the music didn't die when Mendelssohn died. Now, I do not read music, you know. I mean, I, you, can, you can give the script to me upside down. I wouldn't know the difference. And when Stefan visits us once a year, you know, he would, his piano is in my office. It's an old garage that we turned into an office and a space for his piano. So when he's not there, the, the piano is a storing place. We have a big blanket over it and stuff stored underneath it and on top of it because we don't play it, you know. So sad how often uh, human life becomes like that, just a store place of stuff until the master artist arrives. <laughs> and when he gets there and we uncover the piano and he takes out a new piece, maybe 80 pages long, and, and I look at, at his eyes because I'm sitting in my study and I'm just captured by his attention. And he reads what he's just scribbled to me and he hears the original sound. You see, what is the most dangerous book on this planet? The book that divided and confused more people than any other book it carries the language of the romance of the ages. I was a bit of a lazy um, student at school. I, uh, I struggled with essays and writing letters. But I have an elder brother. He's a missionary in the Ukraine now for 20 years already. And um, he consumed books. He just had an ability. Him and my mom could just, they glance over a page and they've read it. They could through a book. I read one sentence and I've forgotten what I read. And I've got to reread it, you know. And it takes me ages to get through a page. So um, my elder brother is nine years my senior. He was a reverend in the Dutch Reformed Church for many years before he went to Ukraine and Russia. But way back then, my school days, it would, Cost very little. A little bribe here and there, you know, a little what I'll do for you. And he'll just give you an idea, or write my essay, and I'll just memorize it and go and do his essays at school. And then I had a, a cousin who's a medical doctor now, also lives in Hermanus, and he was three years older than I am. And he was brilliant with German, and German was one of my subjects. And so I would take three or four of his essays and learn it off by heart. And at least grammatically, I was okay for, I passed my senior German classes because of his essays. And often the problem was you didn't get the right subject. So you have to try and force the essay that you've memorized into the subject. That's why people ask, what are you going to preach about? I said, you know, give me any title, one size fits all. My message is one size fits all. Okay? But it's not memorized. <laughs> but the point I'm making is um, a few years later, 1974 in August, I met Lydia while I was with Youth for Christ. And we traveled about a thousand miles or more from Namibia to Durban as a team. And there we had a conference for a few days. That's where I met Lydia. Then I had to travel all the way back. And I started corresponding. And I no longer needed my cousin or my brother's inspiration. Because love finds a language. And now I'd run out of pages. And we just write and write and write and, and read and read and read before I post it off to her and wait. <laughs> 
<laughs> have find any excuse to go, go via the post office. This is long before Twitters and tweaks and Facebooks and, and email. Looking for that letter that would come all the way from the other side of the world, it felt like. You know. Now remember, um, those were the days of the old telephones. Did you ever have those where you have to wind them up, and then you talk through the exchange, and you give the number, and they put you through? Operator. So I would go to the post office without money, and I'll just, you know, and I'll explain to the guy. I said, "Listen, um, I'm, I, mean, I was in the ministry, so I could talk people into things." You know, I'd say to him, "Listen, <laughs> I'm this young missionary, I'm, and I'm in love, and my girlfriend is, um, she's on the other side there. This is her number. I don't have money to pay for the call, but if you can just dial this number. Now the problem is she's got six sisters." I've got a good chance, one out of six, that she'll pick it up, you know. <laughs> I just want to hear her voice. I'll just intercept a little bit. Was it during YWAM, 1978? When Lydia moved back from Pretoria, she was nursing there. She moved back to Peter Maritzburg, Durban area, to finish the final year of nursing. And I was going on a mission trip with Youth of the Mission into Botswana. And um, on my birthday, the 6th of April, I was just so longing to connect with Lydia, just to talk to her. And no money. <laughs> and I go to the public telephone. I've got no clue what her number is. She's just moved to a new city. I don't even know the dialing code. And I walk into the booth and a number pops into my mind. And I start dialing it. No money. The phone rings. She's just come off night duty. She walks past a public telephone that rings, and she walks in, she picks it up. <laughs> we couldn't even talk. We just wept. And about an hour later, we were still connected. We could just talk. And what I'm saying is that when we discover the romance, the desire of God for you, something changes. It's the same old book. But something changes. Your heart ignites to discover the romance. God doesn't want to bore you with the Bible. You know what we've done? We've made an idol of the Bible. But there is a language. Because in the beginning was the word. And the destiny of the word was not the page. But flesh. Flesh, Mendelssohn incarnates every time that same sound is repeated. And God just desires to repeat for all eternity the expression, the exhibit of his glory. Of the majesty of his dream come true in you. You are his dream come true. You have no competition. There is no one to replace you. I thank God for a word that was before time was in the beginning. And the word was face to face with God. And the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwells not amongst us, within us. Did not our hearts ignite while he spoke to us on the way? Life becomes the eternal celebration of the life of the ages. He has no other agenda but to engage your thoughts with his thoughts. Maybe we can just reflect a little bit on Isaiah 40. I'm a bit heavy for this one, so as I press on it, it goes down. So I'll talk. Whoa, whoa. Sorry, my bad. All right. That's funny. Give me two pulpits. I break the first one. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I thank God for the pulpit that you are. 
Lydia and I have spent three brief days here in Jacksonville. And um, we take a lot of Jacksonville home with us in more than one way. (laughs) But I would say what Paul says in Philippians 2 and verse 12, it is, and he says, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Lydia, can you have a big water, please, please? Do you know that the secret, that's okay, my brother. Thank you so much. Did you hear what Paul said in Philippians 2.12? Not only in my presence, but much more in my absence. Take salvation to its ultimate conclusion in your life. Much more in my absence. Paul, what do you mean? I mean, what could be better than a promise of a next visit? Or at least another few epistles. (laughs) You see, New Testament ministry is not measured by how present Paul is. Paul is more present in his message now than when he could ever be in his person. So ministry is measured by how absent you can preach yourself. (laughs) That's economic ministry. Jesus and the woman at the well, igniting the fountain within. So thank God for pulpits, but the real deal is the one in your beautiful feet. The gospel in your face. The gospel that glitters in your eyes, in your gaze. He is so present in you. You are the light of the world. Imagine what Jesus sees in you to make a statement of that proportion. Nations shall come to your light and their kings to the brightness of your rising out of your innermost being shall flow rivers do you notice the plural of living water you carry unstoppable inexhaustible life You never need to ask for your daily bread again. But he gives us a good prayer in its place. In Psalm 2, he says, Today I have begotten you. I'm so glad that Paul quotes Psalm 2 when he preaches on the resurrection in Acts 13. Because so often we interpret scripture In terms of what it points to in Jesus, which is absolutely wonderful, but it's even more wonderful than we discover that the whole book's about Jesus. Indeed it is, but the entire Jesus is about you. And Peter gets the message in James 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 3. You need to get the mirror Bible just for 1 Peter 1 and 2. I did it last year. It's just so beautiful. And it's in the new edition. He says in verse 3, we were born anew when he was raised from the dead. I'll put a video clip on Facebook tomorrow that um, on the 11th of May, Mother's Day last year, I preached in Don Keatley's church in in Houston on the three births. I won't have time to go into that tonight, but you'll enjoy it. (laughs) You know that the human race share three births in common without our permission. We did not begin in a mother's womb. Man began in God. We his idea to begin with. There is only one legitimate father of the human race. And no, it's not the father of lies. And uh, here we are, sharing space on planet Earth. And we can go and Google our gathering tonight. And we're all in the same spot right here. Goes, goodook, goodook, goodook. <laughs> we cannot hide from Google. Here we are, located, co-located on planet Earth in Jacksonville. 
in Grace Church, in one another's presence. But you go, the GPS of God, God's positioning system, you'll find a lot more than this gathering equally located in the throne room. Sadly, the vast majority of those equally located in the throne room have their minds trapped in another realm. And hopefully we'll get into that tonight in Colossians chapter 3 where Paul says, If then we have been raised together with Christ. Now remember Paul's if is not a question mark, it is an exclamation mark. But now before we go there, I'm still in Psalm 2. Remember I said, you don't have to pray for your daily bread anymore. Because <laughs> take no thought what you shall eat or drink. <laughs> he wants to engage your thoughts with a feast that satisfies. Because we were not designed to live by the kind of bread that you eat and you hunger again. But there's another harvest that's already ripe and you cannot labor for it. You cannot buy it. It's not for sale. So the real prayer <clears throat> that Paul quotes in Acts, in Acts 13, when he, his text verse, his Psalm 2, says, Today I have begotten you. Now remember what Peter said, 1 Peter 1 verse 3? We have been born anew. When? When Jesus was raised from the dead. You see, there is a greater foundation to your new birth than your most sincere decision to follow Jesus. If your decision could save you, then Moses could be your savior. What power can I do? The good that I want to, I cannot do. Woe to me, says Paul. <laughs> but when I discover true north, when it comes to true faith, the faith of God, what was it that God saw when Jesus died? God saw humanity's death. Reckon yourselves then. The word reckon in the Greek is the word logizomai. It means to make a calculation to which there can only be one logical conclusion. In the mind of God, one has died for all. Therefore, all have died. Because in the mind of God, Jesus' death was our death. So where were we when Jesus died? We're talking about God's faith, what God believes. We were in him. Because of God's doing, says 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, of God's doing, are you in Christ? How did we get there? Ephesians 1 verse 4. Before the katabalo, some translation says the foundation. Katabalo speaks of the fall, the cast down. You know that God found you in Christ before he lost you in Adam? Before the katabalo, God associated us in Christ. <laughs> now, Lydia and I, are associated for 40 years, which is a pretty long time, very pretty. So people who know us, when they see the one, the one reminds of the other. That's what the word associate means. The one reminds of the other. You know that it's impossible for the father to have one thought of his son that excludes you, humanity. Jesus Christ is the testimony of God concerning you. This thrills me. <laughs> I don't have to try and sneak into his presence, you know, and knock, knock, knock on heaven's door, and hopefully I'll catch someone's attention somewhere, sometime. I saw on Facebook the other day, they had this picture of Jesus standing, knocking at the door. He says, knock, knock. So the voice comes from inside. Who's there? It says, Jesus. What do you want? It says, let me in. It says, why? I want to save you. Why? What do you want to save me from? From what I'm going to do to you if you don't open the door. <laughs> you receive pictured. Revelation 3.20. 
Like, yes, God trying to just get in <laughs> to the individual heart. He's knocking from the inside out. Let me out. <laughs> Because our minds have been veiled for so long that we just don't see the treasure that we carry. Jesus is not hiding somewhere in the pages of the book, but he is indeed mirrored there to be unveiled in you. The mystery of the ages is Christ in you and Christ in the nations. Today, I have begotten you. Have you noticed the next sentence? We're back in Psalm 2. Today, I have begotten you. Ask me. Remember we said, we don't need to ever pray for our daily bread again. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. You pray for it if you want to pray for daily bread. But <laughs> You'll find that daily bread will follow you. <laughs> Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. See a harvest that is already ripe. God cannot do anything more to get mankind more saved, more reconciled. <laughs> but he says to us, lift up your eyes. Ask me for the nations. And behold... I give you the ends of the earth as your inheritance. <laughs> so no wonder when Paul prays that the eyes of our understanding will be flooded with light. He gives context to his prayer. He says, I want you to, to discover how co-seated you are because of his death and his resurrection. I want you to understand that he led us, Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8, he led us in his triumphant procession on high. Oh, verse 7, that's just before Ephesians 4 verse 8. You get Ephesians 4 verse 7. In the Revised Standard Version it says, Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of the gift of Christ. <laughs> We're talking gift language here, not reward language. We sometimes do ministry schools at home, and then we have a whole bunch of people that come and attend. And Lydia and our one son, Christo, they can cook a feast to 100, 200 people, as many. They, they, they turn any kind of meal into a feast. And so I've often watched the guys standing in the queue, you know, where they get the food. And they kind of look at the length of the queue and they look at the pots and kind of think, I hope there's going to be enough of that by the time I get there, you know. And, 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 and the idea is, to, you know, eventually the pots get little, less and less. And so the, 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 the scoop, you know, the, the, depending on how far back you stand in the queue, you're just going to get a little bit. The guys right in front, they get the full portion. No, no, no. Not when Lydia cooks. <laughs> she got me very thin from my mother. <clears throat> Grace was given to each one of us according to which measure? The measure of what, we, what God eventually calculated we deserve. Do you know that the love of God is not the reward for good behavior? God did not send Jesus to the planet because he felt really pitiful and sorry for the, for the world. No, he went away, sold all he had and bought the entire field, not from the devil but from the lies that we believed about ourselves. To persuade us of the value that we carry, the treasure, but we've been veiled to see that treasure. Because we've been so engaged with our own thoughts. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible is in Romans chapter 1, verse 19, where Paul says that whatever can be known of God is manifest in man. <sighs> whatever can be known of God. is manifest in man. 
But verse 18 says, remember verse 17 is the revealing of the righteousness of God. Not what Adam did wrong, but what Jesus did right. From faith to faith, this is what God believes. And the download of faith ignites your heart to see what God sees about you. What his faith says about you. But our own minds engage with the ponero system, the labors and annoyances and hardship system of the wrong tree, engage us in unrighteousness. And what do we do? We suppress the truth. Kata echo is the Greek word. Ana echo. Ana is always upwards. <laughs> but the kata echo is this. I'm engaged with the things that are below. This brings us back to Colossians chapter 3 verse 1. If then we are raised together with Christ. Now this is Paul reasoning here. He says, if it is true that in the mind of God, we mankind, we are co-raised. That Jesus' resurrection means to the Father that mankind globally stood absolutely represented in this one man's doing. Both Jew and Greek alike. While we were dead in our trespasses, long before we decided to become a Baptist or a Catholic or whatever denomination of choice. We were associated and we are associated in the man, Jesus Christ. So Paul says, if then we are raised together with Christ, set your minds upon the things that are above and not upon the things that are below. That's Colossians chapter 3. You know that it's possible To be absolutely co-seated together with Christ. But to have your mind absolutely engaged with the things that are below. That means your below realities define you. And the moment the below becomes your reference and what defines you, it becomes your conversation. And it can become a most exhausting conversation. You know, it's, um, I see in America as well, it's like custom to, when you greet somebody, you say, how are you? You really want to know? <laughs> Do you have time? <laughs> so how are you today? How was your day? Dare you ask? Because our minds for generations have been so engaged in this below reality that it's become our conversation. It's become our identity. It's become our reality. But the gospel declares not something that becomes true by popular vote. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He's not trying to engage with our popular philosophical conversation. Jesus didn't come to compete with Buddha, Moses, and Muhammad. The truth as it is in Christ. The truth about what? The truth about you. You will know the truth. The truth about what? The truth about you. Because we believe the lie about ourselves. This is what we've inherited through Adam's fall. Did I tell you about the original sin story from Morocco? Morocco. I might as well tell it again. But you can Google it. Our daughter pointed us to this beautiful story. It's an old legend in Morocco. Where um, the original sin is told as to the serpent approaching Eve with the fruit. Wanting to engage her in this and said to listen, if you eat this fruit, you will become a lot more beautiful than what you are. And of course she immediately refused. She says, I have got absolutely no appetite for that fruit and I don't need it because um, I have no competition. He says, oh, oh you are making a big mistake. Adam has a secret lover, and he's hiding her here in a cave in the mountain. And she says, no. He says, come, I'll show you. And he leads her up this windy road into the mountain. And sure enough, they get to this cave, and the serpent prompts her to look into the cave. And she did. And 
what she saw there was a reflection in a pool of water of her own face. And she thought it was the other woman. And she immediately grabbed the fruit and ate it. And the legend continues, all those who are not deceived by the reflection in the water returns to paradise. Paradise. I love the word paradise. It's the opposite of the word hades. Do you know that the word hades, haides, not to see. Para ides. Para speaks of the closest possible proximity of source. And ides to see. So that we may know, even as we've always been known. Engage your thoughts with throne room realities. Set your mind upon the things that are above, not upon the things that are below. Because we have a reference here. Our reference is the faith of God. What God did in Christ Jesus matters more than what anybody else or us did in our own private capacities. None of our doing can match his doing. So you might as well enter into his rest where you cease from your own labors. Back to our photographer friend. He has this moment captured. And he's about to go with this moment into a place where it will be documented in such a way that nothing that happens to the prince can destroy the original. So when John gives reference to the testimony of Jesus Christ within him, he says, in the beginning was the word. He says in 1 John 5, 9, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. So what a joy to engage our thoughts with a different dimension. The dimension that is released in our spirit by revelation. We declare the gospel not to entertain or bore people with more and more preaching. I mean, if ever there has been a nation that's had about it with preaching, it's America. (laughs) But I want to tell you there's a freshness in this word, in the organic understanding of God's original intent that breaks into the heart. Did not our hearts ignite within us? And it leads to -to face-to-face encounter. It leads to feasting at his table. Mm, Thank you, Jesus. So, ask of me the nations. I give you the ends of the earth as your inheritance because today I have begotten you. We are co-begotten in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Hmm. I was on my way to Isaiah 40. And uh, I'd love to do Isaiah 40 in the mirror, so maybe the next edition will have a bit of Isaiah 40 in it. But in the meantime, we'll go into, I think this is a New American standard, I'm not exactly sure, but you'll enjoy it. Um, It's Isaiah and chapter 40. A voice cries in the wilderness. Do you remember that? And this voice announces a highway in the wilderness. And I love the detail. Every high place shall be brought low. Every valley shall be filled up. Every crooked place shall be made straight. Even the rough places shall be made smooth. That means every possible excuse we could have to feel distanced from God. Neglected by God. In one act, God would break through into our world, into our wilderness, to rescue our minds from the lies that we believed about ourselves. Why did the first generation die in the desert? One reason. Because of unbelief. What was the unbelief all about again? We are grasshoppers. No, you're not. You're an image bearer of God. You carry his promise. You carry the nations within you. Oh no, but our leaders told us we're grasshoppers. So you hang around in the wilderness. 40 years later, you die in unbelief. Because you believe a lie about yourselves. Because you've manufactured these giants. 
out of proportion when the truth was there wasn't a man amongst them that wasn't shaking with fear, equally defeated in Pharaoh. But oh, how we've preached to defeat the devil back into business, and it's good business. Until we discover the language of the cross, how publicly defeated every principality and power was when he disarmed them. What was their weapon all about? The document of guilt. Do you know that you can no longer be blackmailed? Because the document of guilt was nailed to the cross. Okay, Isaiah 40. Why the highway in the wilderness? The next verse tells us, And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. That's good news. What was the problem with our reference? Why was the wilderness our reference? Let's read on. I want to read you from verse... Oh, no, this is Isaiah 58. Oh, this is a, a small print. But um, let's get to it. Yeah. That's Isaiah 40. If it doesn't sound like Isaiah 40, we'll try the next page. This is verse 18. Listen to this. To whom then will you liken God? Ha. What is your image of God? I think I mentioned it yesterday that the word idol, idol or idolatry, is the word image. This, the theme of the book is about the image and the likeness of an invisible God, redeemed in human form. That's the theme. You don't need to study the Bible in any other light, because otherwise it becomes most confusing. In fact, I wrote a little chapter in the Mirror Bible, and I call it the Incarnation Code. And you can buy the book just for that trap chapter. If you cannot buy one, you can take one for free, or I'll email it to you. I'll email you to that chapter. But here we go. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with Him? As for the idol, a craftsman casts it, a goldsmith plates it with gold, and a silversmith fashions chains of silver. This sounds like a very expensive item. Do you know that there is nothing more expensive than religion? It's the most expensive business on the planet. It'll cost you everything and give you nothing. And feed the fantasies of your imagination. I mean, look at this language. In the context of every highway, of, uh, sorry, the context of a voice crying in the wilderness. Now remember, Isaiah 40 begins with a very level runway. And it concludes with mounting up with wings. Like an eagle. Now that's not difficult for us to understand. I thank God that Lydia and I didn't have to come here by boat. Thank God for wings. You see, spirit dimension is not some unique dimension that only the few most holy ones qualified to access. Spirit dimension is the dimension of your design. Setting your mind upon the things that are above. <laughs> because whatever it was that trapped me here, died together with Christ. That old mindset, all the old reasoning, whatever it was that we inherited, the futile ways of our fathers, died there. And in his resurrection, we were born anew. <laughs> we have a new reference. We no longer need to do the Deuteronomy 28 thing, the shoots and ladders doctrine, to try and get to the finish. You begin at the finish, where you are co-seated, co-elevated, co 
justified, sanctified, co-redeemed, co-embraced because of his doing. Right, back to Isaiah 40. Now, in the setting of the highway in the wilderness and mounting up with wings like eagles, Holy Spirit, Spirit of Christ, brings our attention back to what it's all about. <laughs> you see, we can get our doctrine so neatly defined, but if we miss out on this, on the image and the likeness that we bear, we miss the whole deal. We cried a bit today, Lydia and I, because we, we lost our little dog. <laughs> And our son, I mean, he, he had to go and bury him. And so I'm in shock. Now, I'll tell you what, if we can feel this emotional about a pet animal that we engaged with, I mean, this is part of our family. But so often, we engage with our beliefs in that capacity. It can really become very emotional, very, it can become very attached. <sighs> Before Adam discovered Eve, God took him into the garden and said, I want you to name all these animals. What is the quest? I wish we had time to talk about ecclesia, the word that we translated to church. Do you know that ecclesia begins there in the garden? Ek is the original, source, origin, kaleo to surname. To identify by name. So here it is Adam's job to identify the animals. What was this exercise all about? To find his match. To find the mirror that reflects his being. And no match could be found for him. And then God put him into, in the Septuagint, the Greek translation says, into an ecstasy. Into a deep ecstasy of sleep. And out of Adam's innermost being, Eve was brought forth. And Ish became Isha. The Ha of the very name of God. Oh, Jesus. You see, Jesus did not come as an example for you, but of you. He's not trying to gather a few popular votes for the Christian cause and, and kind of keep us like one keep pets. But he's gathering a bride. We may discover the image and the likeness, the language of our origin, the language of redemption. You see, the mounting up with wings like an eagle is not some hoo-ha, wonderful joy ride. There's a lot of joy, a lot of bliss there. But if we miss out on the romance, we miss out on the deal. Because our minds have been so occupied for so long with an image that we have created and manufactured in our imagination. God has found such a tangible presence in human form, in flesh. I'm back in Isaiah 40. So we've got this very expensive image, gold-plated, real gold, silver chains. You know, we can, we can become very creative and decorative in our imagination. And then verse 20 says, uh, now let's read for, an, yeah, verse 20. He who cannot afford such an expensive um, idol selects a tree that does not rot. 
So look, if you cannot ex afford that kind of level of imagery, then at least to get mileage out of your image, get a hardwood tree. And that's the first requirement. The next one was... Um, he selects a tree that does not rot. He selects out for himself a skillful craftsman. And how skillful we've become in our theologies. Oh, we've carved words and ideas. Do you know that ideas become eyes? And uh, the skillful craftsman prepares an idol that does not totter. <laughs> Come on, I mean, we, we, we're talking something very sincere. We, we, we want to get some mileage out of my image of God. So when I really put pressure on him, I don't want him to, to fall over. You know? I mean, I've, I've got to get at least some kind of standing for my idol. And it's got to be f out of a tree that does not rot. Because I could be poor for a long time before I can afford that level. But both levels are engaged in the same Dimension. Look at God's language here. Verse 21, Isaiah 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been declared to you from the beginning? <laughs> you know, if you want to understand the gospel... You might as well go back to Genesis. Hebrews 13 verse 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. So how far can we go back with yesterday? Do you know that eternity bear, bears witness to the sameness of Jesus? God never had any other agenda but to rescue, to redeem his image and his likeness in you. The mystery of the ages is the unveiling of Christ in you. <laughs> He's not hiding in outer space or in some date in the future. You know, the doomsday prophets have got a big problem, not just with their dates, but with their doctrine. Has it not been told you from the beginning? Now, when God entered into his Sabbath, it was not because he was weary, because Isaiah 40 continues to say, now let's quickly jump over to verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord? It feels like that sometimes, doesn't it? Where am I? Verse 27. And the justice due to me escapes the notice of God. And God is now in the next verse apologize. Say, guys, I'm very busy. You've got to understand. You know, I've got the whole of India, China, Russia. So just, just hang in there. No, no, no. He says, have you not known? Do you see the image that we have created of God? The one that wouldn't totter when we demand attention would qualify there. But we're speaking about the creator of the universe who cannot get you out of his mind. He needs no reminding of you. He needs no persuasion from your side. <laughs> you don't ever need to waste a prayer or a song again on trying to get there. We've wasted so much time. Sincerely, trying to get there when there is where we are to begin with. Co seated, engage your thoughts with things that are above and not about the things that are below. It doesn't matter how justified we feel with our below reference. He says, and uh, do you not know? Verse 28, have you not heard the everlasting God? You see, now we're talking 
the true genesis of image and likeness. You see, we've reduced, we've dwarfed our concept of God, even gold plated it into that which cannot even begin to compare with our genesis. And we've given stature to an illegitimate father, the father of lies, who was a murderer from the beginning. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Do you see the language of the word that was before time was? The word. Faith cometh. How do I know? Because my reference engages my thoughts with throne room realities. I know then I come from above. And he led us, Ephesians 4 verse 8, he led us as trophies in his triumphant procession on high. I mentioned, I think, today that to the leadership group how that in our minister in, in a Baptist church in Jamaica. Did I say this last night or perhaps in the church? Son, I can't always remember. But we were in Jamaica during the time of the Olympic Games in London. And you remember that week when Jamaica won so many gold medals. We were in Jamaica. And that Sunday, I preached in a Baptist church. And I was able to just, you know, congratulate the Jamaicans for their wonderful achievement. And I said to them, you know, um, we are so proud of you. It's so wonderful. It's such a moment to share with you. But um, the gold that your champions bring home remains their gold. You can do a selfie with them if you're related or very close friends and perhaps have the privilege to put their medal around your neck, but you've got to give it back. And sometimes we think that um, that's kind of, you know, what the gospel sounds like, but it's not. You are the trophy of God. You share the podium with him. You are what salvation is all about. I know we get very spiritual. We say, oh, it's all about Jesus. Yes, it is indeed. But Jesus is all about you. He doesn't have an identity problem. He needs no salvation. We do. <laughs> he needs no reminding. We do. <laughs> we thought prayer was overcoming reluctance in God. No, no, no. It's the other way around. Have you not known? Have you not heard? And it's just restoring to us that which was from the beginning. Image and likeness language. Why did God enter into his rest? Because he was weary? Because he was exhausted? No. Why would my photographer take these lenses off the camera and just zip it up into watertight bags and sit back and glow? Because he knows that the image is captured there. <laughs> He invites us to enter into his rest where we cease from our own labors. Our own labors cannot match his labor. And he labored. He spoke the most extreme language of labor where he humbled himself to become the scapegoat of the human race so that his own creation would murder him with his permission. To redeem our minds. To rescue us from our darkness. The next verse, Ephesians 4 verse 9. Having led us as trophies in his triumphant procession on high. It says, he who ascended is also he who descended into the lowest parts of the earth. Into the deepest darkness of our hell. And he broke the chains there. And he redeemed us. I want to get there. Remind me, lady. I see. We'll, if you need to take a break, you can just stretch a little bit and just sit down again. We can. I just quickly want to rush through this next verse here in Isaiah 40 because I'm going somewhere with this. It says, Do you not know? Have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? Do you know that your crisis cannot exhaust God? His understanding. Is inscrutable. 
He gives strength. Did you hear any kind of reward language there? He gives strength to the weary. And to him who has no might, he multiplies power. Remember school way back? When we started doing our first math and we discovered, oh, one plus one. Wow, and our minds went, shh. And then they go into like, this week, last week, going to do multiplication. <sighs> and everything just bounces off the wall. He multiplies strength. Gee, sometimes we think, you know, you've got to really break through in prayer and try and really convince God that if he doesn't respond to your prayer now, it's gone. If you just give me a little hint, then we're busy with the old idol again that we've carved in our imagination. But the everlasting God of the ages multiplies strength. And I'm going to tell you just now how it happens. So you just hang in there. He multiplies strength beyond your budget. You cannot buy it. <laughs> but he's in the multiplication business. Five loaves, two fish, barely a little lad's meal. Especially if he's a teenager. To go back to the Olympics, you know, we get the, that split-second decision between gold, silver, bronze. The rest of you try again next year or four years from now. Split-second. And sometimes we think, oh, Jesus just, just beat the devil to it. No, no. He didn't. You can go back frame by frame and discover that the devil is not even in the picture. Oh, we've put the devil in such a wonderful, prominent position. I'm always surprised when I go into Africa, you know, into wonderful Pentecostal churches and churches of all shapes and sizes. And then you'll have a typical prayer meeting before you go and preach. And, and there'll be a moment of, oh, hallelujah. And then, Father, and then, and devil. I said, who brought him into this conversation? And sometimes the prayers can get so engaged with the devil that you can't completely miss the point. As if there was no good news in the gospel. As if all principalities and powers were not equally disarmed. So we empower a defeated devil again with our preaching. And we create these monsters, these giants that keep us trapped in the wilderness of unbelief. But we're entertained there because thank God for the pillar of fire by night. The cloud by day. The provision daily. No one's getting sick. And the miracles and the supernatural are so amazing. But we miss out on asking him for the nations. And possessing the ends of the earth as our inheritance. Because we're believing lies about ourselves. Mounting up with wings like an eagle is a dimension where we discover the integrity of our authentic identity, innocence, value, redeemed. He does not grow weary or exhausted. He gives strength. He multiplies might to them that have nothing. So Ezekiel, you think these bones can live? God, why didn't you bring me back? Can we just go like replay mode? If you've got this all on record, can we just go and replay mode to where there was still a hint of life left? Maybe we could put some of them on a drip, you know, and really get our best medical staff in, and we, we'll fly them in. We'll, we'll come in with our best possible means to try and rescue a few. Ezekiel, can these bones live? And Ezekiel does what we often do in our prayer life. We play it safe. We say, oh God, thou knowest. <laughs> and we feel relieved. <sighs> and God said, oh, I like that prayer. And I'll just stand back, Ezekiel, and let me show you what I'm going to do. He says, Ezekiel, you come and prophesy over these bones. Speak to these bones. <laughs> you get the picture of the resurrection life. Today I have begotten you. 
And I've placed my word of your co-begottenness in your mouth, in your heart. We didn't get to verse 9 of Isaiah 40. You, herald of good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain. Lift up your voice with strength. And we talked this morning on what gives elevation, what gives volume to your voice. It's all in Colossians chapter 3. We've recorded this morning as well, so you can get hold of that. But where are we? He gives strength to the weary. And now, look at this picture. We're still in Isaiah 40, verse 30. Though the youths grow weary and tired, and some of their most vigorous athletes stumble and faint. What is the picture we see here? The best that the flesh has to give has a sell-by date. Because the glory of the flesh, that's also in Isaiah 40. What shall I cry? All flesh is like the grass. It withers. Its flower fades. The best that the flesh can do. I mean, we can try and patch up, you know, try and really do it. So we can uh, look forever young and jump forever high and run forever fast and play the most amazing golf in our imagination. And follow the idol. Hopefully to become something that will eventually catch the attention of who cares if you have the undivided attention of the creator of the universe, the author of the ages, who does not grow weary, who desires to multiply strength. He says, here they are, our champion athletes failed our expectations. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. What does God do? He gives strength to the weary. So how do we engage with this renewing of strength? How do we persuade God? Ah, the key word is they that wait upon the Lord. So here we go. We are prepared to do our waiting. And oh my, 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 can waiting become boring? How long must I wait? Let me give you a hint. If whatever you define as waiting upon the Lord does not renew your strength and cause you to mount up with eagles, with wings of eagles, you're waiting wrong. Let's go back to the picture of a runway. I was in Blantyre, Malawi, when the Holy Spirit dropped this into my heart. We're getting ready to, we're just taxiing, getting ready to fly. And I tell you what, if you can fly in Malawi, do that. By road, it's an adventure, but it takes days to do a couple of hundred miles. Anyway, so here we're on this beautiful runway in Malawi. And we know that the aircraft that we are strapped in is designed to take off on this runway. We don't see the pilot sitting there panicking, thinking, okay, people... I'm not sure whether we're going to make this, you know, but we're going to try our best. So as we go lift off, I want you to just try your best and just imagine we're going to actually fly. Okay, let's just, we've got to get everybody's mind in unison. So let's just go into this like, no, no, no. <clears throat> Do you know that the fastest Ferrari, well, you guys don't go for Ferrari, Ford, what should we go? But let's go Formula One. We more, the fastest Ferrari does not get airborne. Maybe for a moment, you know, when it hits an obstacle. And we've burned so much fuel on our runways, waiting upon the Lord. But our minds are strapped in the wrong vehicle. And very soon you have to apply your brakes again, because we go burnout mode there. I'm going to increase my fasting with another week. I'm going to get up an hour earlier. This time, I think 3 o'clock in the morning is it. That's going to be it for me. And you start praying in tongues a little, little bit longer than what you did last week. All the time trying to just get into mounting up with some kind of wings. And we buy the recipes. And they're so available because it's such good business. We'll pay any price to chase after him. And he's been after you all along. I 
I'm so glad for language. The Hebrew word that we have translated, they that wait upon the Lord, is the word kavah. And you can go and Google this, or you can go and look it up in a Hebrew dictionary. The word kava means to entwine. No, it's not the passive twiddling of your thumbs, waiting for God's next move. It is the place where the mind of God engages with your thoughts, where the faith of God ignites in your heart, that not our hearts ignite within us. That's kava mode. And because of that place of entwined thought, we mount up with wings just like eagles. Have you noticed that eagles do not fly the way ducks do? (laughs) And now, notice the detail here. You will run and not be weary. The very thing that exhausted you yesterday in ministry, in business, in marriage, in life in general, the very same thing that exhausted you this yesterday has no further effect upon your life. You will not be weary. You will walk and not faint. You are designed to live on planet Earth in skin, in human form, with your mind engaged with throne room realities where we live from and no longer towards where we cease from our own labors, mounting up. Hallelujah. What is that, brother? Let's do that. Is that what it means? I thought, let's go. Okay, let's, let's take a break. Thank you. Thank you.